All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Robinson, and I'm an assistant teaching professor in the UW Department of Chemistry. And I'm losing screens in front of me here. There we go. Uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in today uh, for our chemistry education group seminar. Uh, we're thrilled to be welcoming Professor Renee Link this afternoon. To start today, uh, we are interested in hearing how you heard about the seminar. So Colleen has uh, posted a poll everywhere in the chat. Uh, her uh, So pollev.com and then her ID is C-F-C-R-A-I-G, C-F Craig. Um, and so you can get to the poll there. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge as the University of Washington and attendees from other institutions, the Coast Salish peoples of this land, uh, which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. Our speaker today is Professor Renee Link of the UC Irvine Chemistry Department. Uh, she designs, manages, and teaches the Organic Chemistry Lab course there, reaching over a thousand students every year. Um, her work has focused on using active learning in large courses to create a more inclusive and equitable learning experience for students from all backgrounds. Uh, she received her PhD from UC Irvine in 2008 in Organic Chemistry um, and later turned her attention to education research. Um, she was already working on flipping large courses before it was cool in the pre-pandemic time um, and she has been able not to not just uh, survive the last year and a half um, but I would say that she has pretty much thrived um, she has published on both the transition to online learning um, and on our topic today uh, uh, specifications grading. So we started our conversation here at UW on specifications grading last spring uh, with a talk by Santiago Toledo. Um, and we are looking forward to continuing that conversation and learning a little bit more um, about how we can monitor student proficiencies um, and how that works uh, for Professor Link uh, at a university that has class sizes uh, similar to our own class sizes. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to Professor Link. Uh, welcome. Hi, thank you for uh, bringing me. I'm sad I couldn't visit in person, maybe next time, because I have never been to UW, so I would love to visit, but you know, we will do what we can, right? So give me just a second to get my screen share going here. And so I was doing Zoom before it was cool also, because I've been teaching uh, remote lab lecture sections for hmm, six, seven years now. So I'm quite Zoom proficient. So that also means I am able to keep an eye on chat while I am talking. I'm very good at this. So um, if something comes up, you want to throw it in the chat at any time, I'll keep an eye on it and uh, address it when I find a spot I can fit it in. Okay, so um, again, thanks for inviting me and I'm excited to talk about our specs grading at UCI. I like to do acknowledgements first in case I run out of time. So I'm going to start there. Um, so the uh, first two people I need to acknowledge are Dr. Kate McNelly and Dr. Will Howitz. They are former graduate students at UC Irvine or my head TAs who helped me design the specs grading system you're gonna hear about today. They've both since graduated and moved on to their own careers when teaching focused positions, Kate at Emory and Will at Georgia Tech. Um, and then they're both continuing to use specs grading in their courses there as well, um, to the extent they're possible because they both started their jobs in the pandemic. So <laughs> they are getting by. Um, I also need to uh, thank my past and current uh, lab head TAs, so my previous head TAs, uh, Taylor, who helped us actually implement specs grading in the gigantic course after we piloted it in the small one, Sarah and Pia, uh, we got through pandemic teaching together, and they helped me transition the in-person version of specs into the online version we had to do. Pia is still my head TA as well, so she's helping transition back to in-person, and my newest head TA, James Griffin, is working on that with me as well. Uh, we have actually six professors of teaching at UCI in chemistry, and I'll explain what that job means in this just a second. But um, my colleagues that work most closely with me in, in uh, labs are Kim Edwards, Steve Meng, and Susan King, and we're all, we all work very closely together in our lab program at UCI. We're all focused on, um, at least partly on lab courses, Kim and I exclusively almost on lab courses. We have um, three professional stocker managers. Simon Lamb was my stocker manager who just went on to a uh, high school teaching job here in Southern California. So we're thrilled for him moving, moving on into that position. And Denise Bowie's taken over his place and she's getting to learn how spec grading works as well. Mel Nguyen and Michael Tran also keep our labs running. Um, and of course they have their teams and my students and TAs and, uh, and learning assistants who went along with my wild ideas here of changing grading. Um, my chemistry colleague, colleagues in general for letting me go along with these ideas as well. And I'm gonna call out Professor Karen Burke and you'll see why in a little bit. 
Um, Alex Liu, Mike Morris, and Elizabeth Wan helped me get my flipped lecture class into specs grading um, in a hurry in pandemic teaching as well. And then I have several collaborators who work with me on these projects. Cameron Denaro is my, my fabulous stats expert who's at our Division of Teaching and Learning Excellence and Innovation at um, UCI. Dr. Lynn, Lynn Reimer is an education researcher who helps me with things that when I don't know how to do them because I'm an organic chemist, not an education researcher. Uh, Paulette Vincent Ruse, you'll hear about a little bit later. Courtney Sobers and Vanessa Ralph as well. And then our uh, DTI is always very supportive of us here at UCI. So I'm gonna start really quickly by telling you about my job. And some of you might've come in a little bit early, heard us discussing this. Uh, professor of teaching or teaching professor can vary as a position at different universities. So I wanna give you a little context about what my job is here at UCI and how this works in the UC system, especially for any uh, grad students or postdocs who might be in the audience who are you know, thinking about a career like this. So um, I have represented the pieces of my job with buckets. And yes, these are secondary containers from the labs. Um, because when I use the bucket here is because when we're talking about our advancement cases in our department, we tend to say we have three buckets that we have to fill to varying degrees, scholarship or creative activity, teaching and service. And for the regular professor track and the professor of teaching track, it's the same three buckets, but they're organized a little differently. So if my uh, colleagues who focus more on research than on teaching, but of course do teach, um, their buckets look a little more like this. Their main focus is scholarship or creative activity. Creative activities in here because we can't forget the arts. Their scholarship is creative activity as well. Um, they do, of course, do a significant amount of teaching and service as well. My buckets look more like this. So my main focus is teaching, although I do have a scholarship and creative activity component. And of course, we do a ton of service. We all do a ton of service. We all know that. So it's the same buckets, just organized a little bit differently. And we do actually have a scholarship requirement for our advancement in our jobs. So my position is, um, is the working title is professor of teaching and I'm at the rank of a, the equivalent to full professor at this point. Um, the formal title in the UC system, in case you ever come across this is lecturer with security of employment or at the, at the full professor equivalent level at senior lecture with security of employment. Although I'd be honest, I don't like being called senior anything that hurts a little. Like, when did I become senior? Um, but uh, that's what those two titles are kind of interchangeable here, just to give you a context. And we are um, full members of the faculty. We are full members of the Academic Senate, and we have the equivalent of tenure. So I'm not working on a contract. I have a permanent long term job, just like the rest of my colleagues do. And that can vary from place to place. So I just want to put that out there um, in case people are interested in these types of positions and see one of ours advertised. We are not advertising one yet, but this is true across most of the UC schools. I also want to give you a context of what I teach, and this has been alluded to, but I'm going to give you this in a visual. I, my job during the academic year is to run the organic chemistry labs, pretty much all of them. Um, my colleague Susan King runs the majors and honor sequence, which is a very small group of students, 100 to 200 at most. Um, I run everything else. <laughs> so we're going to do this visually. Uh, each of my baby anteater icons here represents about 100 students. So I'll let you count for a second. Yep, that's 13 anteaters, yes. So we have. I typically have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 students in a normal year. Um, I hit 1,500 last winter for various pandemic-related reasons, uh, and I'm looking at 1,300 starting this coming January. And this is pretty normal for me. Um, of course, I cannot possibly do this on my own. So I have a lot of grad student TAs. And so I, I will have typically anywhere between 30 and 40 um, TAs in a normal quarter. Of course, I can't manage that on my own. So I have one to two head TAs who are also graduate students uh, who are selected because they are interested in teaching or at least think they might be interested in teaching and are helping me uh, create and run things behind the scenes. And I have my professional stocker manager as well to help handle the logistics of the course. And that leaves me up here at the top. Uh, I like to say running a medium-sized company within the department. I am both the C-suite and the middle management of a medium-sized company, essentially, all by myself. Um, I do not get paid as if I am the C-suite of a medium-sized company, but I essentially am. Uh, one of my friends pointed out that maybe this also looks like a pyramid scheme, at which case I am doing this all wrong because I am not making pyramid scheme money either. But this is what it looks like to do my job. <laughs> So um, this 
colors everything that I do, I think always in how does this work in large scale. I generally tend to not think about things if it's only doable at small scale because that's just not the world I live in. And large scale for me um, is not necessarily what is large scale for other people. All right, so what I'm mainly going to talk about today is specs creating at scale. So um, the publication that we currently have out is our pilot class. We are working on one for our large scale class, but just we're slowly getting through it. Um, the comment of me being able to get some publications out in this last year has mainly been because I had things that were all wrapping up and we were able to get them out the door. <laughs> There's going to be a lull for a little bit while we kind of get moving again. I just was lucky enough to be at the end of several projects and able to shove them out in this process. Uh, so this, the, what you have seen is small scale, but this does work at large scale. I'm going to tell you about the large scale as well. All right, so let's start by talking about grading the necessary-ish evil. Um, and I'm going to start with a quote. I decided to pursue a career that involves teaching because I really love grading and assigning letter grades, said no one ever. OK, I have not pulled everyone, so maybe somebody thinks this, but I certainly don't. And I'm guessing you probably do not either. Most of us did not get into this job because we just really, really, really wanted to grade and rank people. Um, if you ask anybody, it's pretty much the worst part of the job or one of the very worst parts of the job, but it's a part that we get stuck doing whether we like it or not. And a lot of us tend to do what was done to us. Like we just kind of go, okay, well, this is how grades work. Whatever that was we experienced and we do it. Or we'll get advice from colleagues who are also doing what was done to them. Uh, but when we think about grades, we look at research on grades. Um, there's some things we know about grades. And if you're looking for a good, concise quick history of grades, I recommend the uh, reference down here at the bottom. It's got a good quick recap of what we kind of know and don't know about grading. Um, things that we know so far. Grading does not actually motivate students to learn. As much as we think it does, it does not. It motivates them to earn a grade, which is not necessarily the same thing as learning anything. Those two things are not necessarily correlated. So grades do not motivate students to learn. Uh, norm reference grading or curving fo uh, forces competition, even if we don't want the students to compete, we're setting them up to compete by default. Curving can also push out students from marginalized groups. These students are being pushed out by many other systemic forces, but curving just adds to it and just makes the shoving out the door even more um, dramatic. Even if you're not curving, points-based grading can lead to a focus on the points instead of the learning. So the focus can, when you have a lot of points attached to your grades, it becomes, how do I get more points? How do I get more points? How do I game this system to get more points? And students often feel detached from their grade. It's not a thing that they feel necessarily that they earned, but it's more a thing that was done to them. Uh, the, the grade is something that was bestowed upon them by the instructor as opposed to something that they earned. Okay, so grading's complicated and not fun. For me, as far as grading goes, again, remember I am teaching thousands of students spread across 60 to 70 sections with like 30 different graders. So grading is very complicated for me. Um, but if we go back and look at anything I've ever said about teaching. So I decided in grad school, somewhere around the middle that I definitely wanted a teaching focused job. In fact, plan A was community college, which did not work out. And somehow I ended up here as plan B. It was what I uh, needed apparently, and this is the perfect job for me, but it wasn't the one I thought I was going to get. But if you go back and look at any history of my teaching philosophy and its various, um, or teaching statements and its various iterations, I will, you will see me saying things like, learning is collaborative, students should work together and learn from each other, uh, that mistakes are good, you learn from mistakes, it leads to learning. You wanna have a growth mindset, like yes, you may not be good at it now, but you can get better. And I wanna be transparent, I don't wanna hide things from students. But if you imagine what doing letter grades for a thousand students across 70 sections looks like, it's not these things. So my grading system up until I redesigned it uh, said, I want you to collaborate, but instead you're gonna compete for grades because it's curved. Not only is it curved, it's curved multiple ways across your section and then across other sections. It's just like, it's a statistical mess that I cannot even possibly explain to you. Therefore, you never know where you stand. I want you to be able to make mistakes and learn from them, but they're also, if you make mistakes that lowers your grade and because it's curved, now your grade's gonna be dropped compared to other people's. And there's never a chance to do things again and show improvement. So I spent the first 10 or so years of my career here. I, I'd like, I'm not 
doing what I want to do. But at the same time, I could not figure out how to do it any better because everything that I looked at, what I looked at and said, well, that's great. You have 20 students. I have a thousand. This is not doable for me. I also dealt with a lot of um, grade related interactions that may be familiar to you. So here are excerpts from thousands of emails, literally thousands of emails I have received over the years, and you probably have versions of this as well. Such as, I worked very hard in this class and do not feel my grade reflects the effort I put in. Probably the single most common email grade complaint I get, or did get. Um, I'm only a few points away from the next grade. Can you round my grade up? Can I do some extra credit? My answer was at least partially correct, so I think I deserve more points. I need more points because I'm trying to go to med school. And there we go. Um, it's not fair. This is one very much for my set class because of the multiple sections. It's not fair. I have more points than my friend in a different section, but they have a higher grade because I have normalized across multiple TAs. So points and grades don't necessarily directly correlate. And it's easy to be on the receiving end of these things. And I will admit I have been this in this position, been on the receiving end of these things and turn into very much um, kids these days get off my lawn. <laughs> like, oh, kids these days, you know, they, they, it's very easy for us to do that. But I think there's an important thing we have to remember, step back and think about. And the thing is that this is our fault. Collectively, we did this, right? We conditioned students to treat grades and points in this way. We did this. So whenever we want to complain about it, we need to step back and think, whose fault is this? And the answer is collectively, uh, not just us individually teaching, but as institutions of higher education and in K-12 and as society in general, we created this situation, right? And so if we don't want this, we have to think about how to change it. So how I got into specs is here. We're gonna pause for a little story and this is where Kieran comes in. So back in the before times when we could see each other and run into each other places, um, we were having some event in our department chair's office as we do, our department's very collegial. We like to celebrate things. Somebody got a promotion or won an award or something. Um, and Whoever could make it was hanging out in the chair's office, chatting, you know, as we do. And I was talking with my colleague, Kieran, who is a theoretical chemist, so we don't run into each other super often. Also, I have a, we work in a giant department. There are like 50 of us, so it's easy for us to not run into each other that often. But I ran into Kieran, and we were chatting, and he was telling me about some really interesting things he was doing with his upper-level um, chemistry major courses and a couple of grad courses where he was letting students retake things or letting them use a final exam as a backup if they hadn't shown they could be proficient in certain things throughout the course. And I was thinking, you know, I told him, like, Karen, this is great. I love that you're doing this. Um, and also, I'm just kind of jealous. Like, I want to do this. I wish I could. And Karen said, well, of course you can do it. Your class, do what you want. I'm like, Karen, I have a thousand students. Like, no, 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 you can't. You can't do this. <laughs> like, thank you. But um, that started me thinking. And once my brain gets on a problem, it does not like to let it go. So I ended up going um, down a grading rabbit hole <laughs> that night, did not get a lot of sleep. Uh, and I just started searching, just literally Google searching on my phone even. And just thinking like, what? There's gotta be something. There's gotta be something I can do. I don't wanna do this anymore. There's gotta be something better. So I came across you know, the usual suspects here. Mastery grading, I heard of mastery grading. I looked at mastery grading. Again, I've got a thousand students, could not figure out how to make this work for me. Uh, contract grading, of course, again, this is nice, but I'm not negotiating contracts with a thousand students. That's not happening. Um, Standards-based grading, again, I love the idea of standards-based grading. I actually went that way first, but it was like, how, how do I track all these different things in my class? That's not gonna be realistic. So none of these felt like they were working for me. And then finally, I actually came across specifications grading. And I think I found it first, if I'm remembering correctly, I found it in a blog post about somebody doing specs grading in like a media studies class, which led me to Robert Talbert's blog post from Calculus, which led me to some other, and I put a bunch of blog posts. And then I came across a podcast with Linda Nielsen, which finally got me to the book. So I did not get directly to the book. I went some random route to it. Uh, and that triggered a memory that I had actually seen this before. I had caught the very tail end of Josh Ring's talk on specifications grading at the 2016 BCCE. I had missed it, the majority of it, because as usual at BCCE, I'm running from one symposium across the campus to another one and just missed the beginning of his talk, but I did catch the end. And I do remember thinking, 
that looks interesting, but also you have 20 students and kind of set it aside. But the more I thought about this, uh, the more I, I really started to come up with a way I thought it actually might work for my class. And after scribbling in a notebook, I actually have the notebook sitting over here on my bookshelf that has all the original hand-drawn notes in it. Um, I actually ended up with the rough draft of a specs grading system by the next morning and not much sleep. I did take naps that next day though. So we went from Linda Nelson specs grading, which is a good place to start, to what we finally managed to get published last year in what was a very heroic effort to get a manuscript out the door during the chaos. Um, and we have our version of specs grading as we applied it to lab, which is what I'm gonna tell you about today. I'm gonna to pause to talk a little bit about specs grading and I'm gonna give credit here to um, Annie Didda and Goldberry Long who are at UC Riverside. Annie um, is a professor teaching in psychology, teaching mainly statistics and Goldberry is, teaches writing and I think she's actually in a med school program. Um, but the three of us got put together on a panel for UCR and we decided to talk in advance to plan on how we were gonna do this. And we came up after our conversation um, with this kind of pieces of specs grading that leads to how it works. And so the main four areas we think about are um, choice, uh, high standards, flexibility, and struggle, and that leading to mastery or, or really proficiency of the concepts. So the idea here is uh, giving students some choice in their grade. Uh, this can be interpreted a lot of different ways. For me, there's a limit to how much choice I can give because of scale, but at the very minimum, I can let the students choose the letter grade they're targeting and know what they need to do to achieve that grade. And I can do that by bundling my assessments together and making it very clear, if you are aiming for a C, this is what you need to do. If you are aiming for a B, this is what you need to do. If you are aiming for an A, this is what you need to do. Make it very, very clear what that is because students should be allowed to make that choice. And I'm going to say something that's sometimes controversial here, but students are adult humans and they're allowed to make choices. And they may choose to aim for a C and we should not be judging them for that because we do not know what their situation is. If they're like, look, I'm just trying to graduate because I got three jobs and a family to take care of, maybe a C is what's adequate. I usually try to encourage them to aim a little bit higher. Like, could we go for a C plus, maybe B minus? But I'm not here to judge my students on what they are, they are choosing for themselves. I'm here to encourage them, but ultimately they're adult humans who get to make choices. Um, the bundles for your letter grade should be increasingly challenging. So uh, you'll see what mine look like in a minute, but you know, we kind of start from the lower grades and build up usually, which is often not how we design our classes. We tend to design our classes for the A students and then subtract, but I encourage you to think about that the other way around. How do we build instead? Um, and the students complete their bundles required for their grade, and that's their grade. So it also makes the system very transparent. To make this work, though, you want to have some high standards. So we want to usually set um, a passing threshold for an assignment, although there are a few ways you can do this. I tend to be binary, although that may change as some of my um, actual course pedagogy changes as well. So um, my assignments are almost all pass, no pass, like you either earn satisfactory or I call it needs revision because no pass sounds like failing and it's not failing, it's just not passing yet. Um, so a typical assignment is usually set at about 80% of the rubric items is passing. So passing is not perfect, which is also important to stress as well. And I do not get partial credit for most things. So either you passed it or you need to try again. Uh, the system does need to be flexible, especially because of this pass no pass idea here. Uh, you don't want to set perfection as the goal because no one's going to meet that because lives are messy and things happen. So I use a token system. Um, students earn tokens by doing some things at the beginning of the class and can earn some throughout the quarter. And then uh, we're a quarter school, in case I didn't mention that. Um, and the students can redeem those tokens for things like being able to revise and resubmit a post-lab assignment or being able to try again on something in, a, in a, my uh, lecture course version. And then having all of these things combined leads to the ability to build in struggle in the class, but I don't mean this in a negative way, I mean the good kind of struggle that helps lead to learning. So instead of what our students will typically do in the systems we've traditionally set up for them, where they do the assessment, they get the grade and they move on, if they haven't met a passing threshold, they have to go back and struggle with that material again in order to earn the credit for the um, assignment. And so hopefully what we're aiming for is for this to lead to mastery of the material or proficiency in the material. Okay, so what does this look like in practice? Um, 
I'm going to kind of skip a little piece that I normally talk about because I think some of you probably are aware of this already, but this tiny, tiny quick version is that when you're setting up your course uh, letter grade bundles, you want to be tying your grade levels to how students are meeting learning objectives for your course. And there are different ways to do this. If you're interested in like the ways that people tend to organize these, I can give you a reference um, at the end. I have it in a hidden slide here that I can give you. That's a really good one. But what I found out really quickly is nobody was doing this for lab courses and lab courses are inherently very different than lecture courses. And the way you set up those objectives and meeting those objectives are just not the same. In fact, what Goldberry um, at UCR and I figured out is lab courses are actually much more akin to writing courses in the way they are meeting um, their course objectives. And that's an interesting thing we're kind of discussing is like how, how similar these actually are. So the way I have my course letter grade bundles organized is I'd like to think about it as um, there are certain objectives in the course that I want the students to meet, but these objectives appear over and over again in different experiments in different contexts. And so to earn a higher letter grade, the higher letter grade you want, you need to show me you can do these things more times and also with increasing levels of difficulty. And in different contexts, and ultimately for an A level, maybe in a context you haven't seen before, being able to apply it. Uh, the first iteration. <laughs> this is the first iteration. This is in the iteration that's in the paper um, for my letter grade class. It has since changed, and I'll show you the simplified version next. So to give you a quick example, we have a variety of assessments built into the lab course. The main things that I want the students to do are the lab notebook, the post lab scaffolds a full and written lab report later on. I just went the wrong direction. Nope. I have a super sensitive mouse that is not cooperating. OK. Um, and the final, the final exam, which I've divided into pieces. And you'll see why the final is divided into pieces in a second. We also have smaller things like pre-lab online homework and video quizzes. Um, so to earn a C in the course in the initial version of my specs grading, uh, the students needed to pass five out of eight lab notebook assignments and three out of six uh, post-lab assignments. They needed to participate in lab lecture five out of like nine times, which is a pretty low barrier to meet. And then they just needed to do a couple of, um, a couple of pieces of the final, but not every piece of the final. They also needed to meet thresholds for the video quizzes and online homework, but those are pretty easy to meet. Most students meet those. To give you another example for the A level, Oh, there we go. Uh, so you can see everything's a little bit higher here. So I've upped the level for the pre-lab quizzes and online homework. We've gone up to seven out of eight lab notebook assignments satisfactory, uh, five out of six post labs. And I asked them to do an additional thing, which is turn this into a full written lab report. Um, and then I've also added a mastery final, which is I need you to do some data analysis in a context you haven't seen before. So that's a higher level of difficulty. So any students, um, that met the requirements here, got the grade. This turned out to be a little complicated. And so I actually simplified it, simplified it a bit. Um, okay, so here's what it looks like now in the little more simplified iteration. So I've based the letter grades, actually, let me back up. We have plus and minus grades at our university and we have to give the plus or minus grades. So I had to delineate what is an A plus or a B plus or a B minus. So, um, so uh, to get the letter grades, so I based the letter grades on the main assessments and the final. So the letter grades are now based on just the notebook pages and the post lab assignments. Um, I did split the notebook pages into two parts, but this was only for virtual remote emergency teaching. This is going to go back to a single notebook assignment when I go back in person. So that was kind of a um, pandemic holdover here. So as you can see, these go up for each letter grade, but it is never perfect. There's always some space to make some mistakes. And I did actually lower it a bit because of, um, again, pandemic teaching. Everyone's just trying to hold it together. So I just said, you know what, let's just take it down a notch for everyone, my, myself and the TAs included. Um, and as you can see, the, ex the final exam pieces ramp up as well. I took the things like the online homework and the pre-lab quizzes and things like that and moved those into the plus minus column. So the way grades work now is your letter grade is based on here. And if your scores drop below a certain level, then you'll get a minus tacked on your grade. 
if you go above and beyond, you get above a certain level, you'll get a plus tacked onto your grade. And if you don't meet either of those things, you just get the letter grade, the regular letter grade. Um, and there is an A plus exception. We do have A pluses. It doesn't matter the GPA. It's just a thing on the transcript. So I've added a little extra criteria for an A plus because it's supposed to be an extraordinary grade. Um, all right, I saw a couple of things pop up in the chat. So let me address those really quickly. Uh, how is lab lecture participation assessed? Uh, I use poll everywhere questions. It's like show up, participate in at least like half the questions, you're good. Um, the lab lecture is more for their own good. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to do really difficult things. We're going over stuff that's going to help them in lab or in their data analysis. So it's more um, a, a, any kind of assessment in lab lecture is more like motivation to keep them coming even when, especially when they hit, they hit the middle of the quarter and just kind of start crashing and burning and reminding them like, hey, this is useful. You should really come and also here's some carrot to get you coming. Uh, what constitutes a pass on a lab? Okay, so we were <laughs> rubrics. Let's talk about rubrics. Thank you. You could not have led me more perfectly into that. Uh, okay, so when you go into specs grading, you have to change your rubrics, <laughs> which, whew, this was the hardest part. I'll tell you right now, this was the hardest part. <laughs> I did not think it was going to be this hard, but it was. Um, you, when you take everything and move it to yes or no, you know, binary system, you really start looking at what you have in your rubrics and going, oh, I need to change this. Uh, so for an example, this is just one post lab assignment that I have in one of my courses. I had a uh, rubric item that was about, uh, this, this lab's about learning column chromatography. So one of the things I asked them to do is compare and contrast this to TLC since they're very similar. And this used to be, um, a thing where you could earn up to seven points. And of course, there was a delineation for five points and three points and et cetera, if they get some of the things, but not all of them. And what we found when we switched from this type of grading to specs grading is that we needed to unpack this. There's too much going on in this rubric item here, right? So we actually thought about this and we thought about these very carefully and split these into more individual things. Sometimes we'll bundle a couple things together because they're kind of very related, um, but we try to break it down into a single, Sorry, my very sensitive mouse is not cooperating. Let's do this again. There we go. Uh, we try to keep it into like very discrete things for each rubric item. And then rather than having any partial credit, it's either they met this rubric item or they didn't. Yes or no. To pass, uh, I typically set it at about 80%. So um, depending on the number of rubric items there are for that assessment, if they hit about 80% of the rubric items, that's good enough for a passing. And if they're below that, then I told them this needs revision and they have the option of using a token to revise and resubmit the assignment, or they can just let it go because as you saw with the grade bundles, they don't need credit for every single one to to, or to pass the class or even to earn an A in the class. And I think this is an important piece of flexibility because uh, sometimes it's just not a time when you can revise and resubmit. Like you got this post lab back, you've got three days to turn it around to, if you want it regraded, um, if you want to revise it and you have two midterms. Let's be honest, it's not gonna happen. And I felt that the system needed that flexibility built in. Um, okay. I'm not sure, I don't quite understand the questions. Fixed grading or grading based on each student minimum maximum score. I need a little more elaboration on the question. I'll keep an eye on the chat if that comes up again and I'll try to answer that. Um, advice for rubrics. Don't try to do it alone. <laughs> so Kate and Will and I did these together. We, we actually tried initially to do a version individually and then edit each other's and we found that this was not working. Um, and what worked best for us is what you see here. Um, this is a picture of the whiteboard in my office and we would get together every week for a set a block of time and go through and redo rubrics together. And we would hash out the language together um, to make sure it was clear as clear as possible. And one smart thing we did because we think in the system of the large class is we created language that we could reuse as often as possible. So when we're talking about, for example, conclusion in a lab report, that language gets reused over and over again. It might be slightly modified for the context, but we wrote language that would work most of the time to save us time later on, because we had planned to do this for all of the courses, not just one. Um, but it really does help 
to hash this out with another person who's very familiar with what you're trying to do. And the other thing we did that I thought was um, really, really helpful is that we ran the initial versions of the rubrics past some undergrads who had formerly been in the class and said, does this make sense to you? Is it clear? If not, what do you think is unclear? And a lot of them said, yeah, it's pretty clear. The only thing is like, we, I would say be more specific, but I also don't know how to be more specific without literally putting the exact answer in the rubric. It's like, good, that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> if, if we can't be any more specific than that, then we've done our job. Um, I wanna mention really briefly the token economy. Uh, so <laughs> I'm loving the chat questions. You just keep setting me up for the next thing. Thank you for doing this. So can they resubmit everything? And the answer is no, because we don't have that kind of time. Maybe in a 10 person, 20 person class, you can do that. My grad student TAs do not have that kind of time and neither do I. So no, we had to limit this. And so this is where the choice and the token economy comes in. Okay, so some of the flexibility and the not resubmitting things is that you know we just don't always get a chance to redo everything because of time and scheduling issues. The other piece is um, I want to encourage students to do as good a job as possible on the first try so they don't have to resubmit it. So there is a price to resubmit something and that is a token. So the way my token system works is I give students um, some tokens upfront for doing something. In the in-person version of the class, it was uh, how I earned an A assignment, which I got actually from Linda Nelson's book. Uh, and it is, I had them write a letter to themselves, pretend it's the end of the course, you earned an A, tell your, tell you have that future self, tell your past self exactly what you did to make this happen. In the online version of the course, uh, I actually grabbed Allison Flynn's remote um, online uh, learning and work plan. If you haven't seen that, it's a really helpful resource to help you think about um, <laughs> not just the students, I actually used it myself. Is it has boxes for things like how I will take care of my physical health, how will I take care of my mental health, how will I manage my schedule, how will I set boundaries with the people I live with to make sure I'm able to do what I need to do. And I had them fill that out at the beginning of each quarter. Not graded. Um, my head TAs and I went through and, and just commented on each of them so they knew someone was reading it. And we gave them um, tokens for that. It was actually also super helpful to do that because we, especially in this last year and a half, we caught um, some red flags where we caught students who said things were like, ooh, I think this student might need some support. And we were able to reach out to that student and try to get them some support early on before things got out of hand. Um, I also let students earn tokens throughout the quarter for doing some things. So in the online version of the class, we do a class engagement check-in about halfway through that I got from um, CD Audi at the Claremont Colleges. And this is a quick, like, um, how to explain this? It's, a, it's just a little Google survey. And it's questions like, how often do you post on the course message board? How often do you speak up in class, either verbally or through chat? Do you feel like you're speaking too often and not making space for other people? Do you feel like you need to speak up more often? Have you formed a study group? How do you communicate with other people? And then what do you plan to do going forward for the next half of the class to make adjustments? Um, I also do a mid-quarter grade check, which is super important for specs grading. I Because the students are often unfamiliar with the system, in the middle of the course, I have them go check their current uh, assignment credits against the grade they're trying to earn and to make sure they're on track and have them contact me if they're not because it's much easier for me to help them course correct in the middle than getting the panicked emails at the end. Um, I let them trade in tokens for various things. Uh, revise and resubmit is one of them. So if they want to revise and resubmit an assignment, it costs a token. I also do uh, tokens for late passes. 24 hour late pass for a token, I do not need to know why. No one needs to perform their trauma for me. Just tell me you need a late pass, turn in the token, we're good. Um, I do, of course, encourage students who have maybe bigger issues coming on, uh, going on to come and talk to me so that I can, mainly it's because I want to be sure I can um, connect them to resources if needed, or that I can uh, help figure out a plan to make sure they can get through the class if that's possible. Oh, thank you for linking Allison's um, uh, online learning, but I, I pull it off Twitter, so I actually don't know where the website is, but that is helpful. Um, responses. I will get to responses shortly. That's coming up too. Uh, how I manage the token system always comes up. I use a Google form. We have Google suite for UCI, so it's easiest for me to use a Google form. Um, it's very structured, so the students, it guides them through what are you submitting this for, how many tokens is it, who needs to know about it, 
It gives them an auto um, email receipt that they then forward to their TA if it's something the TA needs to know or to the head TA or me if it's something one of us needs to know. The head TAs and I just go through and clear um, token trades manually. Unfortunately, we haven't found a way to do it any other way other than manually. We clear it on the back end with that spreadsheet that comes out of a Google form and a dummy assignment in Canvas that is just a placeholder for the, the number of tokens they have. Um, okay, feedback, here's your comments. Okay, uh, so feedback from the instructor, from TAs and from students. And this is for the large scale class. So this is not in the paper that you've seen, this is in the upcoming one we're still working on. Uh, from my perspective, there is not really a significant workload increase in how I would have to administer this class. I mean, handling a class of a thousand students is a giant workload, no matter what version it is. So it hasn't, ch it hasn't changed the amount of work, it's just shifted it around a bit. More than the, only, the only main change is that. Of course, there's time investment to create the system, but that's true anytime you're doing anything new. So of course, you're going to have to invest time up front. Um, I do have to spend a significant amount of time explaining it to people, but that was true when I was in the early days of flipped class as well. So I assume that this will change as other people get on board with similar things. Um, I feel better because my beliefs and my actions are aligning much better. And so that is a positive thing for me. I have noticed a shift in tone from discussions with students. Uh, I hear less about why isn't this worth more points or how to get more points. And I hear more about how do I do this better? So like, I thought this was going to pass. I, I missed all these rubric items. I don't understand why. So it is a little bit about points, but it's much easier to shift that when you're talking with the students to like, here's what you said. Here's why it doesn't meet the criteria. Let's, let's talk about that. Um, and I cannot stress enough how much this flexibility was a lifesaver in the rapid switch to emergency remote teaching, uh, especially in spring quarter, being on a quarter system, our finals week in spring of 2020 was when the world was on fire and uh, all of my colleagues were panicking, figuring out what to do it. I just said, we're just not going to do these things because nothing was curved and there were no points. I just literally went in and did strikeout text through my grade tracker and went, nope. We're just going to cross these things off the list and this is what we're going to do instead and it was very easy um, so i had i did not have the foresight to know that that was coming but i'm really glad that i had managed to get this going in my class before all of that chaos um, from the tas the tas liked the rubrics for the most part they liked that um, they felt it was organized and made grading faster now that they didn't have to agonize over partial credit they could just say yes or no um, the TAs still ask me, can you be even more specific in the rubrics? And like, not unless you want me to do the assignment for the students. So that's always going to be an issue, I think. Um, most of the TAs liked the fact that the revisions were allowed to help the students learn and understand more. Although some of them were concerned about the grading workload. Some of them felt that they were grading more, but I'm going to come back to that. So hold that thought. Um, some student, some of the, uh, the grad student TAs felt bad that they were giving uh, needs revision to students who had gotten a few things wrong. And they felt like that was not fair because they got the same score essentially as somebody who didn't turn it in at all. And some also felt bad when the students were like one or two rubric items away. But I feel like this is less of a problem with the system and more of an issue that I see regularly. Most of my TAs are brand new first year grad students. And what I regularly see is that they haven't quite shifted out of the student mentality to the instructor mentality yet. And so I have to have conversations often with my TAs that like, I understand we feel bad about this, but, and you wanna be nice, but sometimes being nice is harmful. Okay? We're not helping the student by saying, oh, well, you tried really hard, so it'll pass. We're like, no, you tried really hard and that's great, but we still need to get you a little further along. So let's try again is actually the way we wanna go here. Um, from the students. The students liked how they knew what to what to do. They loved the fact that they knew exactly what they needed to do to get their grade. That was universally something people loved. Um, they like tokens in general because they like having the opportunity to just get a late pass or try something again or whatever they need to do with tokens. They like the transparency. Many students felt uh, that it was a fairer system. It was more equitable than uh, curved grades that they were used to. They really appreciated their grade was not dependent on other students and they enjoyed not having to worry about a curve in general. Um, they did not like variability in TA grading. This is not a comment on specs. This is a comment I get no matter what I do because I have 30 plus TA humans, not 30 plus TA robots. So 
understandable, but that's that's um, there are things I'm doing to try to address that as much as I can, but that's always going to be a complication. Uh, they did not like how much weight was placed on the practical exams, which was interesting because that weight has always been there. I think they just didn't see it when they didn't quite understand how the grading was working. So that was an interesting comment. Um, some of them did not like, and they this is their word, cutthroat, which is interesting word choice, where if they didn't meet the grade requirement by one assessment, they did not get the grade. Um, I feel this is missing the forest for the trees here. They're, what they don't see in that is like you had multiple attempts to get that assessment. So if you did not get that assessment after multiple attempts, you probably are not earning that letter grade. Um, and as usual, a lot of people felt that they should be war, uh, awarded for effort more than outcome. So in general, I feel like this is um, a, a better system. I'm happier with the system. Of course, not everyone's thrilled with it, but I like it. Um, I'm going to come back to this uh, comments about grading time. We knew this was likely to be an issue or a concern. So we actually surveyed the TAs in the traditional points-based course before the last time and the last time we ran it. And then we surveyed them again, different group, but roughly the same number um, in the specs graded course and said, how much time self-reported are you spending on grading the notebook page assignments and the lab reports? And here we go. So they said, I'm spending way more time grading and they're not. Um, so. Of course, self-reported times are often wrong. We know that, but the medians did not change. The distribution changed a bit, but there was no statistically significant difference in the two groups for their grading time. So, oh no, my screen froze. Okay, let me try again. Working on my end. How's that? Better? Yay, okay. So I'll let you, I'll give you a second to look at it since you couldn't see it. Okay, so the other thing people usually wanna know is how did the letter grades come out in this? And here are two different courses. The medium sized lab course is about 200 students and the large lab course, I, I've forgotten the exact number. I wanna say it's somewhere between 11 and 1200. Uh, so the purple color here is our points-based course. The last time we ran it as points-based. So this, um, this is fall of 2018 and fall of 2019. This is an off-sequence course. And then this is our winter quarter, which is our large main on-sequence course. Uh, two different courses, but within the same course sequence. And the purple here is points-based. This is winter of 2019. And the turquoise is winter of 2020, which we got in just before the campus closed down. We finished our finals literally the day before the campus closed. So we stuck in there. The thing that was really interesting for me is, um, yes, the letter grades have gone up across the board. I always get asked if I'm concerned about this, about grade inflation, and my answer is no, uh, because I now know what they are doing to earn these grades. I can tell you exactly what these students were able to do to earn these grades. Uh, in the teal color here. In the purple color, it's a curve. Um, so I don't know, it's relative to other students. And so I'm actually more concerned that I was harming those previous students. The other interesting things that this, again, is that this is an off sequence course and it had a huge letter grade shift. For an off sequence course, what this means is these students have most likely failed a chemistry, chemistry class previously. So, um, this is very interesting to me, and this is something we're following up on. Okay, so I see some questions. Did I get pushback from my colleagues for the grade change? So I am the only person who teaches the lab courses. So the only person to push back is me, um, and I think it's fine. Uh, I did not get a pushback from anyone else so far, but I have ammunition for that pushback. And mine would be, here are the things I asked them to do. I can provide you with the actual evidence that they have done those things. And so we can argue about whether or not you think that this is a high enough bar, but ultimately it's my course and I get to decide that. And I am confident that I asked the students to meet the bar, they met the bar, and they are going to earn that grade. And I have the ability to do that because it is my course. So I realize that is not always everyone else's um, situation, but I am very privileged to be in that situation and I intend to use that as much as I can. 
Uh, quick note of how we're doing this back in person. So we are back partially in person now. So this is a grade tracker for the one class that's in person this quarter. Um, I've added a, a thing because I'm like, how am I going to take these students who have not been in lab, some of them ever, and throw them into the end of organic lab? This is going to be fun. So I um, added a technique video assessments. So I pulled um, work from Marcy Towns group and a more recent paper that just came out for an organic version for TLC and have uh, student made videos for assessment. So my students are doing some technique videos and I actually asked a couple of them if I may borrow their um, screenshots and they let me. So we had some TLC monitoring reactions and an extraction. So students are making videos, short videos in lab, annotating them with explanations and we're grading these as pass, no pass. And it's actually um, pretty popular. The students like doing it and they have a lot of fun with it and they're very creative with it. So I'm planning to continue this as we go back in person uh, next quarter for the giant class. Okay, I'm running short on time, got it. Um, we are gonna move into CER direction. So most of what I've described to you is generally SOTL work. I tend to more do scholarship for teaching and learning than chem ed research because I'm not trained as a chem ed researcher and I'm very well aware of that. Um, so I bring in collaborators and this is where Paulette comes in, comes in. Paulette and I are working on a project to look at um, this off sequence class quantitatively looking at uh, their assessments and seeing if we can see is, are we actually seeing a change in the assessments from between the points based course and the spec space course and we're also looking at some qualitative work in the future classes looking at um, surveying some students and interviewing some students about who is benefiting from specs and why and this comes from an anecdotal thing i am seeing i have students who randomly reach out to me to tell me about um what they like about this and those students tend to come from very specific demographic groups and so i noticed that and i brought paulette and said like let's see what's going on here so i think there might be something interesting here so we're working on that for the future i was going to tell you a little bit about specs grading my lecture class but i'm not quite going to make it because i want to keep time and give you a chance to ask me questions so if you want me to go back and mention this at some point later i can but i but i think it's really important to wrap up on um Go, go. What I feel has changed for the course and for my relationships in the course, because they did promise to tell you about relationships. Uh, for me, my relationship with the course has changed. I no longer feel like a hypocrite. I feel like what I'm doing matches what I believe, and that is always a good thing. Uh, the conversations the TAs and I are having with students are far less about points now and much more about content, about how do I do better on this thing I did not get credit for. Uh, the students are able to make mistakes and try again, and all of us appreciate that. I appreciate it. Most of the TAs appreciate it, and the students appreciate it. And the students are also appreciative that their peers are not competitors anymore. They're now collaborators, and that we're all in this together. And again, that has been incredibly important in this last like 18 months or so, to feel like they had that support from each other. Um, I want to leave you with a couple of things, one of which is we do not have to grade the way we were graded. It is possible to do things that are not points-based or curved grading. Students appreciate the transparency and that they have are able to make mistakes. You can do this at scale. You have to think carefully about how you do it, especially things like, no, you cannot revise and resubmit everything, but I have done it at scale. Um, there are large letter grade gains, especially for students who have struggled previously, and this may actually be a feature I did not expect to see that giant grade increase for the off sequence class. And to me personally, I think that's a good thing because these are the students who need the most help and being able to help boost them up um, is always going to be a positive for me. And I'll leave you with a comment from a student. Angelina was in my course last year. She emailed me and wrote this long, lovely email and I responded to her because I was putting together a version of this talk. I said, can I use your comment and I'll just anonymize you? And she said, no, no, do not take my name off of it. Use it and I want my name on it because I want people to know that I said this. So I'm gonna let you read that for a second and I'll wrap up there and I'm gonna check the chat while you read. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask a question here. So the how do in lab experiments work with token revisions? I'm not quite sure the question is. Can you elaborate on the question, please? Like as far as um, 
um, while I wait for an elaboration, I'm going to address the next one, which was, uh, do you have concerns about students missing key concepts because they didn't have do three labs in a row, whatever. The students generally show up and do the labs. They just don't turn in the assignments, which are two different things. Um, in person, they don't just not show up. Most of them will show up and do them. Um, and also the grade requirements are one post lab assignment higher when we're in person than what you saw for the um, uh, remote version. And that's because, again, I was just trying to take the pressure off of all of us just to get through this last 18 months. However, I want to mention something here. This comes up often. Are you worried that they missed key things? What makes you think they were getting them before? Just because they showed up and did something and turned something in does not mean they learned it. Okay. And so I think this is one of the things I think I want to address is a lot of times that we think because we did a thing and we said a thing in class that the students learned a thing. And that is not true, right? And so I would rather they learn a subset of things well than try to learn a whole lot of things poorly. Um, and so this comes, this what this comes down to is thinking about how you structure your grade requirements. And so to get to, um, well, I teach all three classes in, in, in the in the lab course uh, lab course sequence. And so I'm making sure that by the end of the sequence, they have caught all of the things. So I've adjusted my grade bundles that way. Now, when I teach a lecture course, I do, um, I do teach lecture in the summer, so a five week summer class. And that one is structured a little bit differently. So what I've done is in that one, I've gone through all of the uh, learning objectives I have for the course, and I've split it out into what I think are essential outcomes. If you do not know these things, these things you are going to fail in the next class, and that is my minimum for a C. And then higher level outcomes, which are the more advanced things where it's good if you know these, but you probably aren't going to utterly fail if you don't. And so you have to organize it a little bit differently, depending on what type of course you're teaching, whether it's a prereq for something, all of these things are things you have to take into account. So what you saw specifically for a lab course is a part of a sequence that I have specs graded in all three. If you're doing this for a different class, you've got to sit back and think like, what do I do for my course? And it's going to be different for everybody. Um, do the, oh, okay, let's see. Would it be useful to look at student performance in subsequent courses? It certainly would be. Um, I actually did that for my flip class when I went from traditional to flip class. And that was actually one of the things we looked at and it was very interesting and, and they did better. Um, I have not been able to get set that up yet because uh, right after I put in the gigantic specs class, the whole world collapsed. <laughs> so I've been trying to survive for the last 18 months. So what I like to say is that um, if I could stop having to reinvent courses, I will gladly do some of these other things. <laughs> right now I am still reinventing courses because I got to figure out how to get 1300 students into organic lab in winter quarter who have never set foot in a lab in college. That's my current project. My current project is make sure the students don't burn down the building in January. <laughs> no, um, let's see, do tokens allow uh, students to repeat an experiment? I do not grade on the outcome of the experiment. I am not training lab monkeys. Um, I am here to help students learn how to science in general, and the outcome is not the point. I don't grade on yield, I grade on explain your yield. So you can utterly fail to get a product, that's fine. Tell me what you did wrong and why, chemically, why it was wrong. And that's just as good as getting a great outcome. In fact, I actually think students learn more when the experiment fails. And let's be honest, as scientists, 95% of our experiments fail. So if you were ever graded on the first time you did something in research, you probably would fail. And I don't think it's fair to grade students that way either. Um, okay, a uh, question about have I compared their assessments? Actually, yes, that is in the paper we're trying to get out the door. Uh, we did compare a random selection of students in the traditional and specs based course. And we just compared them on one assessment though, in one course. Um, and we didn't see a difference in that one, but that may be a factor of the particular assessment we chose. We had planned to do another couple of assessments and then COVID happened and we have done nothing. <laughs> so uh, we did not see a change in the one thing, but we have not looked at all the things. Um, what percent of students got a B or C because they aim for that grade versus didn't manage to get the better grade? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that question. I don't have a, a, 
what they asked for. I, I don't know what they, I did not ask them what they were aiming for initially. Um, I would also point out that sometimes students aims change throughout the quarter. Like I do talk with students who are like, I'm going to earn an A. And then they get in the middle of the quarter and they're like, I took 21 units and have a job. I'm going to survive and that's okay. So um, I think that would be a thing we would have to track over time. Um, I will say there are students who are aiming for an A and didn't reach it. Often, if that happens, it's because of the final. And what I suspect is happening there is they are getting a lot of help on their post lab assignments. And then when I ask them to do a new thing without help, they're realizing that they are not actually able to do the thing. Um, that is a really hard problem to solve. I don't know how we solve that. I don't know if we can solve that, but it is a, it is a concern. Um, did I get everyone's questions? If I did not get your question, please tell me. I'm watching the chat pop up. I do have several colleagues who are interested in specs grading, one of whom is working on introducing specs grading in a chemical biology upper division lecture class in the winter. And we're planning to write that one up as well, helping her work on how to assess that. So look for more specs graded stuff coming out of UCI in the future. I'm hoping it's going to come out of your school too. Uh, there is one question um, from Lutz uh, in the, the in the chat. I'm not sure if I heard you talk about his question. Is this the one about did it um, uh, comparing the points based versus the specs based of the same assessments? Yes. Did you yeah. talk about that? And I just blanked out. Yeah, that's okay. I can repeat it again. Um, it's okay. We all I we all check mistake. out. I need revision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and let's be honest. We all check out mentally. That's how brains work. Yes. Every so often, your brain wanders off, and you're like, "Come back." Mine, especially if I'm not actively doing something. This is why I switched to flip classroom myself. I was honest with my students. I actually do this thing. I say. I do this thing still to this day when I do flip class. I say, let's be honest, how many of you fall asleep in class? And my hand is the first one to go up. I slept through like 80% of my classes in undergrad. I'm going to be completely honest here. And this is partly because I was a, um, I was my first gen college grad. I worked three jobs to put myself through school and did it completely independently from my family. And so partly I was just sleep deprived, but also partly is I can't pay attention for that long if you're talking at me the whole time. No matter how interesting it is, my mind's going to wander off. So I even have the notes to prove it. I still have my notes from undergrad and they start off very neat and then they get sloppy. And then there's like the line that goes off the page because you kind of did this thing. I have the evidence of me falling asleep in class. And it's not anything the instructor was doing badly. It's just that's just, my brain doesn't work that way. Sorry. Um, but to, to reiterate the question that came up, um, I did look at, so I did, take a subset of students on one post lab assignment assessment. And we did have multiple TAs uh, grade them on a points-based rubric and on a specs-based rubric. Um, and we pulled, yes, we pulled a subset of students from each of the courses. Sorry, I, I, I'm actually saying this wrong. Let me back up to what we did. We pulled a subset of students from points-based and a subset of students from specs-based courses. We pulled one assessment, the same one, for both groups, and we graded them on a points-based rubric to compare them with uh, multiple TA graders, but graders I trusted to do a good job. Um, and we did not see any significant difference between the scores on a points-based rubric for the two groups. But again, we pulled one assessment. We pulled the one that was gonna be easiest to grade, but may not have been the best one to pull because of that for certain things. Uh, of how that assessment works. And also we only got to do the one, we wanted to do another two. And then um, that was in winter of 2020. So we did not do any more because we've all been trying to survive. So maybe we might revisit that at some point, but now like we've moved on. I haven't had a points-based class. My last points-based class was spring of 2019. So I no longer have really any good comparisons at this point. I would also argue anything we try to compare right now is probably a poor comparison because everything is different now. Um, along that line though, could you grade some of your current student work? Uh, if they're doing the same sorts of lab assessment assignments um, that you can say like, oh, this is our same version of this, like pull current work graded on a rubric from 2019 and see um, 
I guess I, I understood Litz's question to kind of be the opposite of what you were saying. So you were saying like, has overall course performance improved, right? Like, are they doing better work now, right? Um, where I understood the question to be more, uh, can you say that like a student now gets the same or a different grade overall in the course than what they would have gotten with all of your normalization and everything else? Right. So the best I could say, because that's a complicated question to answer, like it would be complicated to get that information, right? But especially with the normalization part thrown in there. Um, but the best I could say is that for that one assessment, because the scores weren't really any different, that the yeah. student would have gotten a lower grade. But that lower grade, is that truly a lower grade or is that an artifact of a forced curve? Yeah. And that's the part where I feel like I well, this is the hill I will die on. I do not <laughs> necessarily believe my previous grades. Yeah. Which is a terrifying thing to say. It was the best I could do at the time. I would not do that now. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like if I could go back in time and change that, I would. It's a very, very, actually, I'm not thinking about that as a very vulnerable thing to say. Woo. But yeah, but I said it in CNE news. So <laughs> I said that, and then it came out in CNN News. I'm like, oh gosh, she put that quote in. And she asked, she, um, she asked me if I wanted her to take it out. I said, no, leave it, because you know what? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say it. That was the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. That was terrifying. Um, any other questions? I'm happy to answer any like, how do you manage this in a giant course or anything like that? Because I know you have large classes, so. It's always fun to talk to other large class people where nothing is designed to work for us. Like, can we talk about how Canvas is like never designed for classes of this scale, but neither is anything else. Oh, intro bio lecture. Oh, you could totally do this with intro bio lecture. Um, and I have scoured the literature for every specs grading paper I can find in literally every discipline, not just STEM. And I have found zero from biology, zero. So be first, go do it, <laughs> which is very strange. I thought for sure I was gonna find a bunch of biology examples. Nope, not one. I am surprised by that. Um, Me too. Yeah. It was shocking. Not very many in physics either. And physics is usually ahead of the game and just yeah. Nothing. Engineering is yeah. actually on top of this one. That, um, yeah, that's a, I guess that sort of makes sense in a, when you think about what engineers are, are doing and they're, you know, there's so much process involved in, um, in becoming an engineer and thinking through how to solve problems. It, I guess it seems like it would lend itself to that kind of rating. Um, and the bridge either stays up or it fails, right? It's like, <laughs> there's no partial credit if your bridge falls down. <laughs> right. So. Right. Um, so come in the chat it was I'd love to know more about the the specs for um, lecture courses. So I'm just throwing that up here. Um, so the way I organized this one, actually, let me go back one more. Okay, so um, the way I've organized this one is essential outcomes and higher level outcomes. So essential outcomes are um, I'm teaching the first quarter in organic lecture. So I'm mainly teaching structures, resonance structures, acid base. Um, Stereochemistry, conformers, spectroscopy. I don't even get to touch reactions. Like they get reactions in the next class. So I'm just teaching those fundamental things. So what I've done um, is uh, just um, pulled out like what are the core things. So to give an example for resonant structures, and you know, we people may have different opinions on this, but for resonant structures, I said the core essential outcome is can you recognize valid resonant structures? Like, can you do that? Okay, that's a C level. Um, can you draw your own from just a single starting structure? That's more of a B or A level thing, right? Um, and it's gonna be more essential as they go on later, but if they can at least get that basic part down of recognizing what makes a valid resonant structure and being able to compare them to each other, they can probably pick up the drawing as they get more and more practice with it in later courses and mechanisms. So I had to kind of delineate like what is essential here and what is higher level. And again, everybody may have different opinions on that. And that's for you to figure out with your class. Um, so I took all those essential things and made those the requirement to pass the course. And then the B and A level were the more higher level things. 
Um, now, ideally, I would like to track this by literally those outcomes, but Canvas does not make that easy. And I did not have a lot of time to think through this process. And so I had to go with the easiest thing because I was doing this in um, June of 2020 was when I was putting this together. So I just go with what can I do right now to make this livable? Uh, so what I did is I actually have the outcomes group by chapter and they have uh, multiple choice quizzes in Canvas, which are their essential learning outcome quizzes. Um, I've got it structured so that each outcome shows up roughly twice per quiz so that and then the passing threshold high enough that they've most likely not guaranteed but most likely hit um, that outcome at least show me they can do it at least once per quiz. Not promising that everyone does some people might slip through but it's going to be a small number. Um, and then I want them to retain that information. <laughs> so I'm, I actually do a requiz same content but different or, um, scattering of questions on like a couple days later and if they pass all of those that's a c if they want to be an a i took those higher level outcomes i made those more open-ended questions so these are now a canvas assignment instead of a quiz they're going to draw and write things out for me uh, they get graded either yes or no on the rubric but i don't actually tell them why it's wrong if it's wrong and their retake for that one is actually corrections i ask them to uh, look at what you answered we said it's not right. Here are some guidelines to start with how to assess your answers. Number one, did you just get the main idea right or wrong? If you got, if you're confident about that, uh, did you miss something small? Check your formal charges. Did you draw too many atom, too many uh, bonds to carbon? You know the common things. If it required an explanation, did you explain or did you regurgitate words you heard in class, which is not an explanation? Um, and so they their retake for the higher levels is to submit that. So they write, here's what I answered. Here's why it's wrong. Here's what is right. And, he, and the key piece I would love to add it to all of these is here is how I will not make this mistake in the future. Um, so they get everybody gets two shots at a quiz, whether it's the multiple choice quiz or um, the doing a submission or uh, a revision, sorry, word correction. That's what I'm looking for on the HLO quiz um, for free. If you need more than two shots, then that's going to cost you a token. And that is it. That is it for the letter grades. There's some other things that contribute to the plus or minus. The final exam is emergency makeup only. Uh, you only take the final if you need to earn credit for a quiz you did not earn credit for. And um, the, the questions on the final, final are labeled by the corresponding quiz. So they only do the sections they need to do. Saves them time, saves me grading. I actually got a comment on this that the makeup final was amazing. No one has ever called my final exam amazing before. <laughs> I may never get a comment like that again. Um, guidelines pre-written. Scott, are the guidelines about how what to look for to correct your question? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I actually yes. provide those up. Um, I don't provide them the very first time. I provide them after the first quiz, and right. then they so refer to them throughout the course. So, so for each of those like objectives, you have a pre-written thing to give to them when corrections come in, essentially? Not for each objective. I have it in general. So I say, look, oh, okay. these are the kinds of things you're going to look for because okay. I don't want it to be projective. I want them to develop the skill of assessing their own work. Okay, cool. And Thanks. deciding what's wrong. Um, they're also welcome to post on, we have a discussion board, they're welcome to post there for help or to come to me or the TA at any time for some extra guidance and we'll kind of nudge them in the right direction, but we won't give them the answer. Um, do I have help graders in the lecture class? Yes, um, our lecture classes uh, have grad TA graders. Um, in a 10 week term, what's the timing? I have never taught this in a 10 week term. <laughs> I only teach this in a five week term. What's the timing? That's a good question. Um, sometimes they would have two quizzes, uh, two quizzes and two requizzes a week. So in a five week, it goes really, really fast. I'm trying to remember, I, I did this in June. I don't remember the exact timing. Um, sometimes the quizzes are doubled up so that they do have two different chapter quizzes, but I, I try to be cautious and only double up the lighter weight chapters. So like, for example, when they hit stereochemistry, they're only doing stereochemistry because that is hard and heavy. Um, the first two chapters, the first one is a lot of review. So it's, it's a lot of like Lewis structures. The resonance structures are the hardest part of that chapter. 
And then the second chapter is acid base, which again is a lot of reviews. So those two get lumped. Um, those two happen at the same time. What book am I using? Smith. Uh, got it sitting on the shelf here if you need to see it, but Smith. That is not my decision. That is a department wide decision. How, how many students are in this class? Um, in the online, it was actually only like 60. Okay. But I have, I do often teach this class with up to like 100. And it's me, it's me and one TA doing all the grading. So I do a lot of this grading myself. Um, the, the ELO, the essential outcome grading, those are, especially in pandemic times to make this manageable, those were Canvas quizzes. So they're multiple choice. But I did ask the students to explain their answer. I did not grade the explanation, but I used it as a prompt to make sure they're thinking through the answer. And also as information for me um, of what they might be missing and what needs to be addressed in, in class. Um, if they miss a single quiz, they, they get a D. So uh, they have multiple attempts at the quiz and then they can make up the quiz on the final. So if they don't pass it here, they can try one last time on the final exam and that will put them in D territory if they miss all of that. But if they've missed this, they're missing the fundamentals of something that is essential to going on in organic chemistry. I really did strip the ELOs down to the most fundamental things. Mm -hmm. So my concern is if, if they can't pass mm -hmm. these, even after multiple attempts and an emergency retake on the final, that they are not prepared to go on. Mm -hmm. um, it worked fine in summer of 2020. Summer of 2021, I had a lot more people in weird situations where they were almost at an A, but because of but one thing, I did make some adjustments because of that, because I think by June of 2020, um, this class ends in like mm, July, late July. I thought 2020 would be worse, but actually I think by July of 2021, everything was just, everyone was just exhausted. And so I did make some adjustments with students. So when I find a student who kind of falls between things here, I will often have a discussion with them. Like, what do you think your grade should be? Mm. Um, and this kind of gets into the ungrading territory. My strategy here is I will contact them and say, don't panic. You're not necessarily failing, but with all these attempts, you still couldn't get here. So I don't think this is your letter grade either. Let's have a conversation and I'm going to let you start. Mm -hmm. And I need to give them the rules. It can't be the grade you were going to get otherwise but I also don't think it should be a D. What do you think it should be? And almost every one of them comes back with a perfectly reasonable grade. Rarely do I have somebody who just thinks, well, I should get the grade anyway. I'm like, no, no, that's not the rules of this game. Let's try again. Um, and actually I often, more often have to tell them not to be so hard on themselves. So I'll have a student who's like super close to an A, didn't quite get there. Um, and they're like, I should get a C minus. I'm like, mm -hmm maybe not quite that low. Let's, let's not be so hard on ourselves. You'd be amazed if you actually ask most students, they're harder on themselves than we are. We, we think they're not, but they really are. Um, our quiz is set at 80%. Yeah, it's about an 80% passing um, for the quizzes. Um, I won't go above 80 because I don't think that's fair. So if I'm at uh, a number of questions where it's either like 84 or 78, then I'll go for the, the 78 instead. Colleen, you have your hand up. Yes, I, uh, there's a, a question in the chat from Sarah that I wanted to highlight that oh. uh, kind, of, kind of got buried. But um, Oh, yeah, I missed it. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, if all students get the same questions, do they tend to share answers for the quiz revisions or resubmissions? Okay, good question. Um, the ELO quizzes and requizzes are um, a question bank. So they'll get subtle variations each time. Uh, the HLOs are not because I can't write that many higher level questions and grade them. Um, so yeah, they may be sharing some things in the background, but this is also why um, I, this class is small enough that the TA and I could just look at those and go like, uh, like looking at the explanations and notice anything fishy. I do ask for an explanation, a written explanation for almost every question. So it's pretty easy to catch things that are like identical, even just by looking at them. Some people may be really good at rewording. That's, I may not catch that. And you know what? I, I'm not going to police everything. I, just, I can't live that way. Um, as far as if when they're doing their revisions, if they're sharing, you know what? If they're learning from each other while they're doing that, I'm fine with it. Like if they're sitting together or on Zoom going, okay, why did we get this wrong and talking through it? I'm pretty sure that's where the learning is happening. And I'm okay with them doing that.
Um, I think I did answer the question. Well, did I miss that one? Did it, was there another one? Um, I think, I think that you did. Um, it sounds like Jack might have made a mistake like I did before. Um, Let me do it one more time. <laughs> I can do it one more time. Jack, I don't which, mind. Question are you, which question are you referring to from Lutz? Oh, okay. He's the sing the single missed quiz. So uh, if the single misses a single ELO quiz, they get they get a D. So yes, you. Oh, you that one. That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can say it one more time. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, it, that rarely happens. Well, okay. It rarely happened the first time. It happened more in 2021, and I think because we are all just done. Like I, I have seen the student breakdowns, um, students really burning out and myself, I'm going to be completely honest here, myself burning out mm -hmm. summer 2021 was brutal. Um, mm -hmm. and I had a lot more issues like that in that course. And I don't think it was the students. I think it was just, we're all just exhausted. Um, so that I think might be an outlier. I do always get a handful of these. You always get a handful of people who are just close, but not quite. And that is the situation where I will actually have a conversation with the student. So if it's just a single quiz and they've tried it multiple times and they didn't get it, I will actually talk with them and be like, what do you think is going on here? Mm -hmm. Especially if they pass the HLO for it, but not the ELO. If they pass the higher level, not the lower level, I'm like what's happening here? Mm -hmm. And we have a discussion about it. Um, and sometimes it's just, they're bad at multiple choice questions. And so we'll, we'll sometimes swap one assessment out for the other. But um, the thing I like about dealing with the cases that don't quite fit neatly in the boxes is that becomes a conversation between me and the student. And I, I ask them to start the conversation. I'll say, here's the situation. I know you're aiming for this grade. You currently, based on what we have here, you're actually at this grade, but I don't know that that's actually a good assessment, a good accurate assessment of where you are. Um, so let's start talking about this and I'm gonna let you open it. What do you think? is appropriate here, given the situation. And they almost always come back with something very reasonable. Uh, it's very rare that someone says, no, I should still earn an A. They're like, no, you know what? I'm just not getting this thing and that's not A-level performance and I recognize that. Um, they're usually pretty good about that. I will often actually have to ask them to stop being so hard on themselves. So maybe they were really close to an A-level and they're like, I should get a C minus. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you're, you're not terrible. Let's. I'm sorry that the school system has done this to you. Um, so, and those are actually really um, nice moments. Actually, I will talk with the student and uh, usually a lot of times it happens by email, but I'll talk with them and tell them about my own times when I did not quite get the grade I was hoping for. Um, and one of my examples is I have a C in the second semester of general chemistry, despite the fact that I had the highest grade on the final, which was the year long ACS exam. And I scored one higher question than the professor. Um, and it's because I was working three jobs and commuting by public transit across San Diego to community college. And I could not get my lab work in, ironically. Uh, and lab grade was part of the lecture grade. And therefore, I got a C in the class. And that is also the person that is responsible for introducing me to the idea of grad school, who also wrote letters for me. The person who <laughs> had to give me the C in the class also helped me get a get jobs on campus. So I did not have to work my crappy retail jobs and it could actually get my classwork done. Um, wrote, wrote letters of recommendation for me to get into UCSD as a transfer student and to UCI as a grad student and um, harassed UCSD's financial aid office to grant me independent status under special circumstances for, for financial aid. Otherwise I would not have continued college. So a C does not necessarily mean what you think it means. And the students are actually really appreciative often of hearing that story. It's like, look, I have a C in Gen Chem. I went on and get two degrees in chemistry. We're good. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. We should all, right. all just start posting our transcripts. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Uh, so I, I'm going to point out that we've got maybe five minutes left, not quite sure. of Renee's time. Um, so if there are any last few questions for the chat, um, or for her, we can take. No way to post in the transcripts. Okay. <laughs> I do. Um, 
uh, watching for questions, but I will say one of the things I've started talking with students about um, with the revise and resubmit of post labs is that this is normal. And so I talk them through the publication process <laughs> and that I tell them if I ever get a publish as is, I will just immediately retire because you go out on top, like we're done, <laughs> never gonna get better than this, time to retire, right? Um, but that I also talk, talk to them about my response to every round of reviews I've ever gotten, which is step one, rage, right? <laughs> like, how dare you tell me my work is not good enough? How dare you, right? And then you step away and you come back and you're like, okay, maybe you have a point. <laughs> Maybe I should fix this. And ultimately everything that's ever been through revision has come out a better paper, right? And so um, the students don't know this. And so I talk them through this and it's like, you know what, it's normal to be upset when you get that back. And they're like, no, it's not good enough. You have to fix it. But also I don't get partial credit for not revising publications. Like I have to keep going until it's good enough. And this is how the world works. Um, and it's often a good, uh, I think a growth moment for them to realize like, okay, what we've been through in school up to this point is not reality. And we're trying to transition them into like what reality is. That's a great anecdote. Um, and just a, a really great like framing for students um, that I think we should all steal um, and take forward. Yes, exactly. Peer review is pass fail, but allows revisions, right? I've actually had this um, argument <laughs> with some colleagues, not in my department, but in other departments who are considering specs grading. They said, well, I don't think students should be able to revise. And they're like, well, then you don't get to revise your next, gr next grant proposal. <laughs> then you don't get to, if you don't think they should revise, then why do you get to revise? And they don't usually have an answer for that one. Yeah, yeah. All right. With that, maybe we'll wrap everything up and end our recording and uh, thank Renee for her time today. Thank you so much. That was fun. Thank you so much, Renee. Hey. Awesome. I know your students, Jack. I've never met you. But I know your <laughs> students. Then, then we'll have to have you up here at some point. Yeah, I talk with Katie like every other day. <laughs> um, <laughs>